Okay, this, phys this uh, physics video contains the solutions for um, free response questions. We'll see if we can get them all into one video. So first one, we have um, this apparatus here. And if we read the description here, the rod here is of negligible mass. The pulley does not have any rotational inertia. So the only real objects that we're considering here are this block that's falling and these two blocks that are spinning, right? The rods have no, uh, have negligible rotational inertia and the pulley also is negligible. So first part, determine the rotational inertia of the rod and block apparatus. Well, the rod and block apparatus has two blocks of mass M that are each a distance of L away from their rotational axis. So we treat them like particles. It's, um, this would be mass times radius squared plus mass times radius squared. So the rotational inertia is 2 ml squared. No formulas or anything besides just the fact that a particle, um, and these are small enough to consider as particles, has um, rotational inertia to mr squared, and the radius is just L. Part B, determine the downward acceleration of the large block. Okay, now here, just like in our recent homework problems, we have two things to consider. Let's draw free body diagrams for each one. We have the block of mass 4m. That would have 4m g, that would be the gravitational force, and tension in the cord. And just note that the tension in the cord is the same on either side of the pulley because the pulley is of negligible rotational inertia, in other words, negligible mass. So those two tensions will be the same. So here, net force equals mass times acceleration. So the mass of the block, 4m times a, is equal to gravity's winning, so 4mg minus t. There's our first equation. Now, for the rotational inertia of this system, there's a torque here from the tension. I'm going to use net torque is equal to moment of inertia times angular acceleration. The torque is from the tension. That's T R. Moment of inertia, we calculated in part A here. It's 2 ml squared times the angular acceleration. Now angular acceleration is equal to A over R. And since I want the just the acceleration, I'm going to make that substitution there. Now I've got a system of two equations and two variables. And I don't want to have t in there. t is not one of the variables that was given. So I'm going to substitute that out. So let's go ahead and do that. Solving this for t gives me 2 ml squared over r squared times a. It's just dividing the r over here and rewriting that a little bit. And I'll substitute that in here. So 4ma is equal to 4mg minus 2ml squared over r squared times a. I'm trying to solve for a. So let me move this piece over here and factor out the a. So that's a. Oh, and by the way, like, well, here you've got a 4, a 4, and a 2, so let's just divide a 2 out. i make that a 2 and that a 2. So that gives me 2ma minus ml squared over r squared a is equal to mg. Oh, there's also an m in all three of those. So that cancels out. What's going on here? What did I write? 2MA. I don't know what that's doing there. This is supposed to be 2MA. And that factoring out the A 
that A is equal to, sorry, A times the quantity 2 minus ML squared over R squared. Sorry, the M's gone. G's is equal to G. Getting a common denominator here. Oh, sorry, there's a 2 there also, isn't there? A common denominator there. I could, the common denominator would be r squared. I could write that as 2r squared over r squared. And that gives me acceleration times 2r squared minus l squared all over r squared is equal to g. And then multiplying by the reciprocal of this, I get a is equal to r squared over 2r squared minus l squared times g. And let me just make sure and check here with the rubric that, yep, that is correct, except when I added this over to the other side, that should be plus. So let me just fix that mistake. He probably caught that there. I added that over there, so that should be plus. All right, that's the answer they're looking for. Um, each one of the free response questions in physics is worth 15 points. That was worth six out of the 15. If you got this far and solved for A from that, I think you got three of them. But T is not a variable that they gave us, so we did need to do both equations and eliminate that variable. All right, um, in part C, when the large block has descended a distance d, how does the instantaneous total kinetic energy of the three blocks compare with the value of 4mgd? Well, if this block has descended a distance d, then that has lost... 4 m g d worth of um, potential energy, right? I guess it would have lost that much. So that means the change in kinetic energy would be equal to 4 m g d. And where is that kinetic energy? It's in the th three blocks. So how does it compare to 4 m g d? It's equal, right? All of that lost potential energy goes into the kinetic energy of the three blocks. Um, justify the answer. Lost potential energy turns into the kinetic energy of the three blocks because energy is conserved. Probably should say mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is conserved. Now, part D. System is now reset. The string is rewound around the pole. And now these are hung like this, so when it swings around, they swing out like this. And um, they want to know when the large block is to center distance d, now how does the instantaneous total kinetic energy of the three blocks compare? Well, this is still gone a distance d. So here, this delta, this change in gravitational kinetic energy is still negative 4 mgd. But these ones, these blocks, have gained, so their change in potential energy is some positive number, which means the kinetic energy is going to be less. There's not as much potential energy available now for the blocks because these have gained some potential energy. So although this still, still loses the same amount, these have gained a little bit and they're rising up. Mm -hmm. So that means the total kinetic energy is now less. 
and the justification is the small blocks have gained potential energy. So less is available for the kinetic energy, something like that. All right. Number two. This is 2002, number two. Um, the cart shown above is made of a block of mass M and four solid rubber tires. Uh, solid rubber tires, so those are cylinders, each of mass M over four and radius R. Each tire may be considered to be a disc, and that's nice of them. I remember I told you that sometimes they'll remind us of these formulas. Um, the carts released from rest and rolls without slipping from the top of an inclined plane of height H. All right, so determine the rotational inertia of the four tires. Well, that would be the rotational inertia of the four tires total is equal to four times one half m l. Oh, radius r, sorry, r squared. And let's see, the fours cancel, so that's m r squared over 2. All right. And part b. Determine the speed of the cart when it reaches the bottom of the incline. Well, this is a matter of the change in potential energy. going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy, right? I guess there should be a negative on one side of that, really, but that's good. what the, the potential energy is lost is going to turn into kinetic energy here. So uh, let's see, the total mass of the cart is 2m, right? That's a block of mass m in the four tires. So you get 2mgh is equal to, now the kinetic energy is going to be split between the translational kinetic energy of the whole cart, which is one half mass of the whole cart, including the tires, times the velocity squared, plus the rotational kinetic energy, which is one half I omega squared, but omega is V over R. All right, I'm making that substitution there. Instead of having 1 half i omega squared, since I have v's here, and I'm trying to find that v. So I just need to solve this mess for v. Um, so let's see what we can get there. I've got 2 mgh is equal to mv squared plus the r squareds cancel out at 1 fourth mv squared. Follow that, okay? So the M's cancel out everywhere. So I get 2GH. I got V squared plus a quarter of a V squared. That's 5 fourths V squared. So V squared multiplying both sides by 4 fifths is equal to 8 fifths GH. So V is equal to the square root of 8 fifths gh. Check that, yep, that's right. All right, after rolling down the incline and across the horizontal surface, the cart collides with a bumper of a negligible mass attached to an ideal spring, which has a spring constant k. Determine the distance x sub m the spring is compressed before the cart and the bumper come to rest. Well, all of the kinetic energy is going to turn into spring potential energy, right? 
So that means I have one half. The mass of the whole cart is 2m. Its velocity is square root of 8 fifths gh squared. That's kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And that's going to be equal to one half k x sub m squared. Right? They called this x sub m, so I'm going to make sure I use the same notation here. And now we need to solve for x sub m. Let's see, those one halves can cancel. So we have that squared, so that's, let's see, that's 16 mgh over 5 is equal to k x sub m squared. So x sub m is equal to the square root of 16 m g h over 5 k. And hmm, that does not look like You know what I did? Oh, I know what I did. I forgot the I forgot the rotational uh, kinetic energy of the tires. So here, let me let me scratch this. The easier way to go here, the total kinetic energy here is equal to the two mgh, which would be the five fourths mv squared, right? That's this. So let's scratch. Sorry. Let's scratch that. So the total, before we um, solve for the velocity, the total kinetic energy came from the total potential energy, right? So that was 2 mgh. And we found that that was equal to 5 fourths mv squared before we cancel out the m. So let's try from there. 5 fourths mv squared is equal to 1 half k x sub m squared. That's where we should be starting from. And multiplying this over to the other side, multiplying both sides by 2, in other words, we get x sub m is equal to... Uh, let's see, 5 over 2 m v over k, square root of that, right? I guess, I'm looking at their rubric there, I guess they wanted the not in terms of v, sometimes it's hard to know exactly what um, variables they want and don't want, but maybe, I mean this is actually, this is correct, but if you don't want to use v, then we could have used this original equation since this since 5 fourths mv squared was equal to 2 mgh, you could have said 2 mgh is equal to 1 half kx sub m squared. And then that would give you the equation uh, multiplying both sides by 2 and dividing by k, the 4 mgh over k is equal to x sub m squared. So x sub m is equal to... 2 times the squared square root of 4 is 2, right? So mgh over k. Let me see if that's what they... Yeah, that's the answer that they have. So they didn't want the v in there. Um, looking at their rubric, it's you're going to get one point less if you leave the v in there out of the total 15. 
so not a huge deal. Um, okay, last part of this one. Now assume that the bumper has a non-negligible mass. After the collision with the bumper, the spring is compressed to a maximum distance of about 90% of the value of XMEB in part C. Give a reasonable explanation for this decrease. Well, if this the bumper now has some kind of mass, then when these two collide, we're talking about a, um, a collision, right? We're talking about conservation of momentum. So when these two collide, they stick together, right? This is going to compress the bumper. It's going to be pressed up against it. That's like an inelastic collision. And in inelastic collisions, the um, kinetic energy is not conserved. We lose kinetic energy. so. That would explain that. Um, so you'd have to write out something like that, but I'm out of room here, so you can figure that out. And that was worth that's that last part is worth two out of the uh, the total fifteen. Okay, let's see if we can squeeze this last one to the same video. So not too bad. We're about ten minutes apiece so far. Um, now we've got a half Atwoods machine, solid disk of unknown mass and radius r it is used in a lab experiment as shown above. A small block of mass m is attached to a string. Other end is wrapped around it several times. The block of mass m is released from rest. It takes a time t to fall the distance d to the floor. Calculate the acceleration a of the falling block in terms of the given quantities. This is just a kinematics problem. So I want to find a. I know t is time t, delta y is the distance d, and the um, initial velocity is zero. So plugging that in and doing a little bit of kinematics, you should find that that acceleration is um, and this is, uh, that's negative d, right, because it's dropping. The acceleration is negative 2d over t squared. Uh, it's just an easy kinematics problem. Um, what was that worth? Two points. Um, part b, time t is measured for variance heights d, and the data is recording, recorded in this table. What quantity should be graphed in order to best determine the acceleration of the block? and explain your reasoning. So um, if we wanted to graph two things, then we would like the acceleration to come out to be the slope, right? And notice that these d's and t's are all positive, right? So they're treating them like positive numbers. So if we rewrote this equation like uh, d is equal to, and this is where, what you would have had in your kinematics equation, right? D is equal to one half a t squared. If you want to find this, the slope here, then you want to graph d and t squared, right? D versus t squared. So that slope of the line will equal one half a. Let's see. They, and there's more than one way that they have. You can look at their rubric, but um, this is their method number one. All right. That's worth a couple points for that part. And then um, on the grid below, plot the quantities determined in um, B1, label and draw the best fit line on the data. And then use your graph to calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. So let me grab my calculator here. So we need to make a t squared column here. Let's go ahead and square those quickly. So 0.68 squared is 0.46. 1.02 squared should be awfully close to 1. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04. 1.04
1.19 squared is 1.42 and 1.38 squared is 1.90. All right, so we want, remember, this is like our y equals x, y equals mx. So I want t squared on the x-axis and d on the y-axis. So this is distance in meters, and this is time squared in seconds squared. You need to include the units there if you want full points. Um, the distance goes from 0.5, uh, lowest to 2. And I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, so that's perfect. You can go 0.5, 1, 1.5, and 2. And the t's go from 0.46 to 1.9. So again, you can do 0.5, 1, 1.5, and 2. All right, first point is 0.46 and 0 0.5. 0 0.46, 0 0.5. You gotta be real careful here. You're gonna be as accurate as you can be. Next point is 1.041. 1.04. This would be 0.1 would be right. That's 1.1. That would be 1.05, so just about halfway. And 1, right about there. And next is 1.42, comma, 1.5. 1 1.42, 1 1.5. And 1.902. 2. And then we draw a line of best fit. Oh dear. Well, let me use a straight edge. Make sure that you get some points above, some points below, something like that. And then we use a couple points that look like they're pretty close to being on our graph, like that. So, um, use the graph to calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. Remember the slope of this is one half a. So one half a would be equal to rise over run from here to here, which is about one rise is about 1.5 minus 0.5. The run is also about 1.5 minus 0.5. So the acceleration is about 2.0 meters per second squared. Don't put two. Remember, you need two to four significant figures there. Let's make sure that that's... Yeah, they have 2.04 in theirs. And uh, part C. Calculate the rotational inertia of the pulley in terms of M, R, A, and fundamental constants. So we're not supposed to use the number here. We're just using A. All right, well, I think we need to do our free body diagrams here. So we have a block of mass M. So we have Mg down and tension up. The net force, mass times acceleration, is equal to gravity winning minus tension losing. And then for the pulley, the torque on it, which is Tr, tension times radius is equal to the moment of inertia of the pulley and I believe it is a it's a solid disk so that's one half mr squared all right or do they want us to use I um, oh we're trying to calculate I so I times the angular acceleration, which is A over R. I'm going to use A over R so I can do my substitutions here. All right. Um, we want to substitute out the T. That's not one of the variables in there. So let's see. T is equal to Mg minus Ma. 
So I'll make that substitution here. That gives me MGR minus MAR, distributing the R in there, is equal to I times A over R. So I is equal to, flip that, multiply both sides by R over A, it's MGR squared minus MAR squared over A. And um, you could leave it like that. There's various different ways that you could write that. Um, but, yep, that agrees with their, with their, um, the only thing, you know what I did wrong, and this is something we should try to be careful with. They called the R capital R, so we really should follow their convention for labeling variables. It probably wouldn't have cost us anything there because there isn't like another R, but just be careful and try to use the letters that they use. All right, last bit. The value of acceleration found in B3, along with numerical values for the given quantities in your answer to part C, can be used to determine the rotational inertia of the pulley. The pulley is removed from its support, and its rot rotational inertia is found to be greater than this value. Give one explanation for this discrepancy. So, what does that mean? It means the ma if you think about it in terms of mass, like rotational inertia is like mass. So, we did all our calculations, we found this theoretically, and then we actually measured it, and the mass came out to be, or the rotational inertia, came out to be a little bit less than what we found. So, what could account for that? So. Think about um, the possible things. Um, one possibility is the string is wrapped around the pulley several times. So if the radius had been bigger, then that would have given us a greater rotational inertia than what we should have had, right? The, um, the I'm sorry, the ours would have been a little bit less, right? And the real one would have been greater. And um, also, if the string slipped a little bit, then ours would have seemed a little bit less, right? Because it wouldn't have been accelerating quite as much. So there's a couple different ways that you can explain that. But note that um, the presence of friction is not one of them. That would have exactly the opposite effect. If friction was present, then when the pulley was removed, it should have had a rotational inertia that was a little bit less than what we measured. Right? You can think about that. And that final part was worth uh, two points out of 15. All right. Don't forget to study problems like the, uh, the stick that's released from here and swings down here. Remember that? We did a couple homework problems like that. Could show up on the test. Hint, hint.